hi. <laughs> so this will be part three. I think what I'll have to do, I'll um, weave in um, and create, I think, a play playlist with all of these um, readings from this fabulous book, Women Who Run With Wolves. Okay, where am I? Here I am. Um, the wild woman carries bundles for healing. She carries everything a woman needs to know. She carries the medicine for all things. She carries stories, dreams, words, songs, signs and symbols. She is both vehicle and destination. Oh, I've read a lot of that bit. Okay, I'll just carry on reading. Um, to join the instinctual nature does not mean to come undone, change everything from left to right, black to white, move east to west, or to act crazy or out of control. It does not mean to lose one's primary socialisation or to become less human. It means quite the opposite. The wild nature has vast integrity to it. It means to establish victory, to find one's pack, to be in one's body with certainty and pride, regardless of the body's gifts and limitations. To speak and act on one's behalf, to be aware, alert, to draw the innate feminine powers of intuition and sensing. To come into one's own with one's cycle and to find what belongs to and rise with dignity. To retain as much consciousness as we can. The archetypal, of the, the archetype of the wild woman and all that stands behind her is the patroness to all painters, writers, sculptors, dancers, thinkers, prey makers, seekers, finders. For they are all busy with work of the work of invention. And that is the wild woman's main occupation. As in all art, she resides in the gut, not in the head. She can trap and run and summon and repel. She can sense, camouflage and love deeply. She is intuitive, typical, normative. She is utterly essential to women's mental health and soul health. So what is the wild woman? From the viewpoint of the archetypal psychology, as well as from the storytelling tradition, she is the female soul. She is more. She is the source of the feminine. She is all that of instinct, of both, of both worlds seen and hidden. She is the basis. We all receive her in a glowing cell which contains the instinct of knowing needs for our life. She is the life death, life force. She is the incubator. She is intuition. She is far, the far seer the deep listener. She is the loyal heart. She encourages humans to remain multilingual, fluent in the language of dreams, passion and poetry. She whispers from the dream night, night stream. She leaves behind on, on the terrain of a woman's soul a coarse hair and muddy footprints. These fill women longing to find her, free her and love her. She is the ideas, feeling, urges and memory. She has been lost, half forgotten, for a long, long time. She is the source, the light, the night and the dark and the daybreak. She is the smell of good mud and the back leg of foxes. The bird which tells us the secret belong to her. She is the voice that says, this way, this way. She is the one that thunders after injustice. She is the one that turns the great wheel. She is the maker of cycles. She is the one we leave home to look for. She is the one we come home to. She is the muddy root of all women. She is the thing that keeps us going when we think we're done for. She is the incubator of raw ideas and deals. She is the mind which thinks us. We are the thoughts that she thinks. Where is she present? Where can you feel her? Where can you find her? She works, walks the deserts, the woods, the cities, the barrios, the castles. She lives amongst queens and camping senas, in the boardroom, in the factory, in the prisons, in the mountains of solitude. She lives in the ghetto, at university and in the streets. She leaves footprints, footprints for us all to try. She leaves footprints wherever there is one woman who is fertile soil. Where does the wild woman live? At the bottom of the well, in the headwaters, in the ether before time. She lives in the tear and in the ocean. She lives in the Cambria of trees which pings as it grows. She is from the future and from the beginning of time. 
She lives in the past and is summoned by us. She is in the presence and keeps chairs at our table, stands behind us in a line and drives ahead of us at the road. She is in the future and walks backwards in time to find us. She lives in the green, poking through the snow. She, she lives in the rustling stalks of the dying autumn corn. She lives where the dead come to kiss and send their living, send living their prayers. <clears throat> she lives in the place where language is made. She lives on poetry, percussion and singing. She lives on quarter notes, graceful notes and the cantada in the sense fiesta and the blue. She is the moment just before inspiration bursts upon us. She lives in a far, far away place and breaks through our world. People might ask evidence or proof for the wild woman's existence. They're essentially asking of proof of the psyche. Since we are the psyche, we are also the evidence. <clears throat> Each and every one of us is evidence of not only wild, the wild woman's existence, but the wild woman's condition in the collective. We are the proof of this ineffable female Newman. In our existence parallels hers. Our experience of within and without her are the proof. Our thousands and millions of encounters in her intraspiritual psychology through our night dreams and day thoughts, through our yearnings and inspirations, these are verifications. The fact that we are bereft in her absence, that we long and yearn when we are separated from her, these are manifestations that she has passed away. My doctorate is in ethno-clinical psychology, which is a study of both clinical psychology and ethnology, the latter emphasising the study of psychological groups and tribes in particular. My postdoctoral diploma is in analytical psychology, which certifies me as a Jungian analyst. My life's experience is a can cantadora, messy mondo, a poet and artist, informs my work with analysis equally. Sometimes I'm asked to tell what I do in my consulting room to help women to return to their wildest nature. I place substantial emphasis on clinical and development psychology, and I use the simplest, most accessible ingredients for healing, stories. We follow the patient's dream material, which contains many plots and stories, analyze physical sensations in the body, <clears throat> are also stories which can be read and rendered into consciousness. Additionally, I teach a form of powerful interactive trancing that is proximate to Jung active imagination, which also produces stories which further elucidates this client's psychic journey. We contact the wild self through specific questions and through examining fairy, fairy, fairy tales, folk tales, legends and myths. Most of the time we're able over again to find the guiding myth or fairy tale that, con that contains the instructions a woman needs for her current psychic development. These stories compromise a woman's soul drama. It is like a play with stage instructions, characterizations and props. The craft mating, making is an important part of the work I do to empower my clients by teaching them age-old craft in the hand. Amongst the fetish and talisman making, these beings anything from simple ribbons, sticks, to elaborate sculptures. Art is important for the commemorates of the seasons of the soul, or a special or tragic events in the soul's journey. Art is not just for oneself or for the maker of one's own understanding. It is also a map for those who follow after us. As you might imagine, work with each person is customised in the extreme, for it is true that people are made one a kind. But these factors remain consistent with my work with people, and these are fundamentals for all human work before them today, my own work as well as yours. The craft of question, the craft of stories, the craft of hands, <clears throat> all these are the makings of something, and that something is soul. Any time we feed the soul, it guarantees to increase. So here are the stories that elucidate the women, wild woman relationship, the stories and myths that herein are the verbatim transcript of my lectures and performances, the tales of presence and all the faithful detail and archetypal integrity. Also, here are some of the questions I ask women to ponder and answer in order to help conscious convergence with the precious wildish self. 
Additionally, I detail for you some of the craft, the experiential artful play which help women retain Newman's in the work of conscious memory. These last two are taken from my workshop of the instinctual woman and these will assist the re-emergence of our wildish nature. As I hope you will see, there are tangible ways to soften old scar tissue, balm old wounds and skill and restore old skills to a down-to-earth manner in a down-to-earth manner. <clears throat> stories and medicine. I have taken stories since I heard my first. They have such power. They do not require what we do, act, anything. We need only to listen. Their remedies for repair and reclamation of any lost psychic drive are contained in stories. Stories Stories engender excitement, sadness, question, longing and understanding that spontaneously, spontane spontaneously bring the archetypes, in this case the wild woman, back to the surface. Stories are embedded with instructions which guide us about the complexities of life. Stories enable us to understand the need for and the ways to rise to submerge archetypes. The stories in the following pages... There's loads... Um, the stories in the following pages are the ones out of hundreds I've studied for decades that most clearly express the bounty of the wild woman archetype. Sometimes various cultural cultures <clears throat> overlay disarrays the bones of stories. For instance, in the case of Brother Gip Grimm, amongst other fairy tale collectors of the past century, there is strong suspicion that the storytellers are sometimes pure informed. There is strong suspicion that the informants and storytellers of the time sometimes purified their story for religious brothers' sakes. We also suspect that the famous brothers continued the tradition of old pagan symbols overlaid with Christian ones, so that the old healer in a tale became an evil witch, a spirit became an angel, an initiation veil or call became a handkerchief or a child named Beautiful, the customary name for a child born during the Solstice Festival. What? I was born during the Solstice. There you go, that's interesting. Was renamed Shashmur Zenrich, Sorrowful. Oh, that's sad. Sexual em elements were omitted, helping creatures and animals were changed in, helpful creatures and animals were changed into demons and bogeys. This is how m many women teach tales about sex, love, money, birthing, death and transformation were lost. <clears throat> it is how fairy tales and myths that exploit, that exploit ancient women's mysteries have been covered over too. Most old collections of fairy tales and myths existent today have been scoured clean of the statological, the sexual, the perverse, the Christian, the feminine, the goddess, the initiatory, the medicine for various psychological malaise the direction and the spiritual raptures. <clears throat> but they are not lost forever, for each story is a fragment in the shape of the entire story. I poked about in what I call the playful fairy tale forensic and paleomethology. I compared many versions of the same tale and collected many new versions of it as I could. I then compare forms reconstructed from the ancient archetypal patterns and learnt through my years of training of archetypal psychology, which preserves and studies all motifs and plots in fairy tales, legends and methods in order to apprehend the instinctual lives of humans. I gain and assist from the templates that lie in the imaginary world and the collective unconsciousness of all humans that we can draw up through dreams and no ordinary states of consciousness. Often the final polish can be gained by compressing the story versions with archaeological evidence from ancient female cultures themselves, such as ritual, pottery, mask, figurines. Simply put, fairy tales, <coughs> locustion. I spend much time ra raking with the ashes with my nose. I've been studying archetypal patterns for 20 years and myths and fairy tales and folklore for much longer. I've learnt the vast body of knowledge about bones and stories. It is easy to tell where the bones are missing in a story. 
Through centuries, various conquests of nations by other nations and both peaceful and forceful re religious conversion have covered over, altered the original core of these old stories. <clears throat> but there is good news. For all structural tumble down existing versions of tales, there is a strong pattern that shines forth. From that we can reconstruct. From the forms and shapes of pieces and parts, we can determine with good accuracy what has been lost from the story. And those pieces can be redrawn accurately. <coughs> Excuse me. Often revealing amazing understructures which begin to heal women's sadness. So much so, so the old mysteries have been destroyed. It is not quite so. They have not all been destroyed. All one might needs, all that one what might need eh, all that what all one might need, all that we might ever need, is still whispering bones from the story. Collecting stories is a constant paleontological, paleontological endeavour. The more story bones you have, the more likely you are able to find a whole story. The more, more, the more whole stories, the more subtler twists and turns of the psyche are present to us, and the better opportunity we have to evolve, uh, to apprehend and evolve our soul work. When we work for soul, she, the wild woman, will create more of herself. As a child, I was lucky to be surrounded by people from many of European countries and Mexico. Many of my family, neighbours and friends were first generation Americans or had recently arrived from Hungary, Germany, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Serbia, Croatia, Russia, Lithuania <coughs> and the Bohemia, as well as Jalisco, Machacan, Jerez, and many of the Aldi's frontiers villages at the Mexico-Texan Arizona borders. They came to farm, to pick, to work in the ash pits and steel mills, the breweries and domestic jobs. Most were not educated in the academic sense, yet they were intensely wise, the bearers of valuable, almost the bearers of a valuable and almost purely oral tradition. Many of, my, many of the family and neighbouring people who surrounded me had, been, had survived forced labour camps, displaced person camps, deportation camps and concentration camps, where the storytellers among them had lived nightmare version of Scheherazade. Many had their family lands taken, had lived in immigration jails, had been repatriated against their will. From these rustic storytellers, I first learnt the tales. From these rustic storytellers, I first learnt the tales people tell when life might turn to death and death might turn to life in any moment. From them, I also learnt the fairy tales in books had somehow been starched and ironed flat until much of their vigour was depleted. <coughs> Later in 1960s, as I migrated west towards the Continental Divide, I lived amongst loving Jewish, Irish, Greek, Italian, Afro-American, Alsatian strangers who became kindred spirits and friends. I'd been blessed to know some rare old Latino communities in the southwest of the USA, such as the Trampas, the Trucas, New Mexico. I was fortunate to spend time with Native Americans from the Inuit in the north through to Pablo the Plains and people of the west, to the Nahut, Lang, Lacando, <coughs> Tehanu, Tehekan, Huasco, Seri, Mayan, Kich, Mayan, Kachel, Mos Mosquito, Kanu, Nazca, Hichua, ja Jivaro, and Central and South America. I've traded stories at the kitchen table under great arbors, in hen houses and dairy barns, whilst patting tortilla, tracking wildlife and sewing the millionth cross stitch. I've been lucky to share the last bowl of chili, to sing gospel with women, so to raise the dead and sleep under the stars in houses without roofs. I've sat down to the fire dinner or both in Little Italy, Polish town, hill country, Los Barrios and other ethnic communities throughout urban Midwest and the far west 
and more recently traded stories about Sparta, Stadros and storytellers in the Bahamas. I have been double lucky that wherever I have gone, children, the matrons, men in their prime, the old coots, crones, the sole artists, have crept out of the woods, jungles and meadows and sandhill to regale me with cores and crabbles. And I too then. There are many ways to approach story. The professional folk folklorist, Jungian and Freudian, and other sorts of analysts and ethnologists, anthropologists, theologians, archaeologists. Each has a different method, both in collecting tales and the use to which they're put. <clears throat> Intellectually, the way I develop my work through stories and through my training in analytical and archetypal psychology. For more than half a decade, during my psychoanalytical, my psychoanalytical education, I studied the amplification of le motifs, archetypes, symbology, world mythology, ancient popular iconology, ethnology, world religion, and fairy tale interpretation, viscerally. However, I come to stories as a cantandora, a storyteller, keepers of old stories. I come from a long line of storytellers, Mezi Mondok, old Hungarian women who tell while sitting on wooden chairs with their past plastic pocketbooks on their laps, their knees apart and their skirt skirts touching the ground. And, quen and Quentistas, old Latin women who stand robust, robust of breast, hips wide, and cry out the story, ranchero style. Both clans of story tell in the plain voice of women who have lived blood and babies, bread and bones. For them, the story is medicine which strengthens and alights the individual and the community. Modern storytellers are the descendants of immense and ancient communities of holy people, troubadours, bards, griots, cantandoras, cantandors, travelling poets, bums, hags and crazy people. I once dreamt I was telling stories and felt someone patting my foot in encouragement. I looked down and saw that I was standing on the shoulders of an old woman who was steadying my ankles and smiling up at me. I said to her, no, no, come stand on my shoulders, for you are as old and I am old, for you are old and I am young. No, no, she insisted, this is, this is the way it's supposed to be. I stood that she stood on the shoulders of women far older than she, who stood on the shoulders of women even older, who stood on the shoulders of a woman in robes, who stood on the shoulders of another soul, who stood on the shoulders. I believe, I believe the old woman, I believe the old women dream about the way it was supposed to be. The nurture for telling stories come from those who have gone before. Telling or hearing stories draw power from the towering com col column of humanity during one-to-one -one across time and space, elaborately dressed in rags and robes or nakedness of their time, and filled to the bursting with life still to be lived. If there is a single source of story and humans of story, this is a long chain of humans, it is it. Stories far older than the art of science and psychology and will always be the elder in the equation no matter how much time passes. One of the oldest ways of telling which intrigued me greatly is the passionate trance state wherein storytellers sense the audience, be it an audience of one or many, and enters the state of world between worlds, where the story is attracted to the trance storyteller and through and told through her. The storyteller furthering soul making. The trance call it El Duende, the wind which blows the soul into the face of the listeners. The trance tellers learn to be psychically double jointed through the meditative practice of the story, that is training oneself to do and psych certain cycle, psychic gates and ego apertures in order to let the voice speak. The voice that is older than stories, the voice that is older than stone, when this is done, the story m may take any trail to be turned upside down, be filled with porridge and dumped out for 
for a poor person's feet, be filled with gold for the taking, or chase the litter into the next world. The teller never knows how it will come about, and that is least <clears throat> half the moist magic of the story. This is a book of telling about the wild ways of wild women archetype. To try to diagram her, draw boxes round her psychic life, would be contrary to her spirit. To know her is an ongoing process, <clears throat> a lifelong process, and that is why this work is ongoing work, a lifelong work. So here are some stories to use as soul vitamins for observations, some map fragments, some little pieces, pine pitch for fasting feathers to trees to show the way, and some flattened underbush to guide the way back to El Mundo Subterrano, the underground world in our psychic home. Stories set in a life into motion, and this is particularly important when the inner life is frightened, wedged or cornered. Stories grease the hoist and pulleys and causes adrenaline to surge. Shows us the way up, down or up or out. As well as our troubles, cuts for fine wide doors in previously blank walls. Opening that lead us to the dreamland, that lead us to love and learning, that lead us back to our own real lives as knowing wildish women. Stories like Bluebeard bring us news just what to do about women's wounds that will not cease bleeding. Stories like Skeleton Woman show the mystical powers of the relationship and how the dead and feeling can return to life and deep loving once again. The gift of old mother death can be found in the character of Baba Yaga, the wild old hag, the little dog doll <clears throat> who shows the way when all seems lost, raises one womanly instinctual arm instinctual arts to the circus again in Basse the Wise. Stories like Leloba, the woman, the bone woman in the desert, teaches us about the transformational function of the psyche. The handless maiden recovers lost stages of the old woman intuition rites in ancient times and such offerings timeless in lifelong guidance for, for all the years of a woman's life. Conversations to humans not limit our most splendid movements of the dance floors, not only our ears to music made by human-made instruments, nor our eyes to taught beauty, nor our bodies to approve sensation, nor our minds those things we agree upon already. All these stories present the knife of insight, a flame of a passionate life, the breath to speak what one knows, the courage to stand, stand, what one sees without looking away, the fragrance of the wild soul. This is the book of women's stories held out as markers along the path. They are for you to read, contemplate and follow towards your own natural one freedom. Your caring for self, animals, earth, children, sisters, lovers and men. I'll tell you right now, the doors of the wall the doors of the world of wild women are few but precious. If you have a deep scar, that is a door. If you have an old story, that is a door. If you love the sky and water so much you can almost not bear it, that is a door. If you learn for a deeper life, a full life, a sane life, that is a door. The material in this book was chosen to embolden you. The work is offered as a fortification for those on their way, including those who toil for difficult through, including those who toil in difficult inner landscapes, as well as those who toil in, in and for the world. We must strive to allow our souls to grow in natural ways and in their natural depth. The wildest nature does not require a woman to be a certain color, a certain education, a certain lifestyle or economic class. In fact, it cannot thrive in an atmosphere of enforced political correctness or by being bent into old, burnt-out paradigms. It thrives on fresh insights of self-integrity and thrives on its own nature. So whether you are introvert or extrovert, a woman-loving woman, a man-loving woman, or a God-loving woman, or all of the above, whether you are possessed of a simple heart of the or the ambitions of the Amazon, whether you are trying to make it to the top or just make it through till tomorrow, whether you be spicy or somber, regal or roughshod, 
the wild woman belongs to you. She belongs to all women. To find the wild woman is necessary for women to return to their instinctive lives, their deepest knowing. So let us push on now and remember ourselves back to the wild woman's soul. Let us sing her flesh back into our bones, shed any false coats we have been given. Don the true coat of powerful instinct and knowing. Infiltrate the psychic land that once belonged to us. Unfurl the bandages. Ready the medicine. Let us return now, wild woman, howling, laughing, singing of the one who loves us so. For, the, for us, the issue is simple. Without us, the wild woman dies. Without the wild woman, we die. Para vida, for true life, both must live. So that was the introduction to Wild Women Who Run With Wolves. And I felt myself getting quite emotional of that story of um, where she had the dream and she was standing on the shoulders of an older woman. And it just made me think of my mum, my grandma. Um, and a real sense of gratitude for them both. And it's hard reading these words and inspiring and exciting. And I'm going to try to read the stories, maybe it's bedtime stories, um, and create a little collection. Okay, that's all for now. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this and yeah, you'll be hearing from me very soon. Bye.